Good morning everyone, today we will continue with our presentation on the basics brain of CT scan. This will be the second part and I think we will need another uh, session uh, after two days for to complete this whole presentation. Last time we talked about the different parts of the brain, the different lobes and how to know where we are uh, in a brain CT scan, especially on the axial view. Uh, and uh, now today we will continue with our uh, presentation uh, we will go uh, a little bit deeper into the different parts of the brain and we might uh, talk a little bit about the uh, intracranial hemorrhage and its different uh, uh, types and pathologies so uh, last time we uh, were talking about the brain CT scan the axial view and as we said this is the frontal view and uh, the frontal lobe sorry the right frontal lobe and the left frontal lobe and we talked about the basal ganglia including the head of the caudate nucleus and the thalamus and the lentiform nucleus which is composed of medially the globus pallidus and laterally the putamen and we said that the lentiform nucleus with the head of the caudate nucleus they form together what's called corpus striatum due to the presence of these striations across the anterior limb of the internal capsule and we said that these white things here and here are just a calcified choroid plexus which is normal in most human beings after the age of 18 or 20 years something like that and we said that this is the sylvian fissure and deep to the fissure as we said uh, there is a part of the gray matter you can see here the gray matter the cortex is colored in i don't know blue greenish color uh, so deep to uh, the sylvian fissure there is this uh, uh, part of the gray matter that's called the insula and insula uh, is uh, covered on the on the, the surface by uh, parts of the adjacent lobes and these parts are called the opericula so we have here the frontal opericulum and the parietal opericulum and if we go even down you'll see the temporal opericulum so the insula is a gray matter okay and light by lined by white matter as uh, we know uh, and but on the surface of the brain it is not seen unless you remove the overlying opericula because it's buried deep into the brain so as we can see here in this magnified view this is the sylvian fissure and deep to it is the insula which is a gray matter here with this greenish color and here is the frontal lobe and the temporal if you go inferiorly and if you go superiorly you will see the parietal lobe giving these coverings which are the frontal opericulum and temporal opericulum and so on this is the central sulcus so the central sulcus uh, will separate the uh, uh, frontal from the uh, parietal lobe if we follow it up follow it up uh, till we reach the midline we will see that this sulcus is the only sulcus that is reaching the midline okay and this is the non-colored view and you can see what uh, we have talked about uh, clearly so let's look here now uh, this is the sylvian fissure or sylvian sulcus and what's the difference from the previous image here we can see that the brain is a little bit atrophied you can see that these sulci are are uh, large and uh, they are prominent and uh, this is due to the brain atrophic changes okay so it is not um, a hydrocephalus or uh, due to pathology it's a normal aging process the brain is atrophied and as you can see the lateral ventricle here and the third ventricle here they are of acceptable uh, size and they are not dilated indicating it is not uh, and indicating it is not uh, uh, hydrocephalus okay so uh, now uh, as we said the brain is a little bit atrophied here and we can obviously uh, see that the cells are prominent so you can see the uh, sylvian fissure or sylvian sulcus uh, even more prominent and more clear and you can see the underlying insula more prominent 
Now, let's look at this XL section. We will just review fast what we have uh, see, see what we have seen previously. Uh, this is the midline, and you can see here and here. This is a fibrous septum, which is part of the dura mater that is called falx cerebri, falx cerebri, crossing the midline, and as we said, it helps keeping the cerebrum in its position and to decrease the movement of the cerebrum with the movement of the head. And here we have the lateral ventricle and you can see the anterior part of it is the frontal uh, horn of the lateral ventricle, the left side, and this is the frontal horn of the lateral ventricle on the right side. And the, uh, this part will be the occipital horns and there's a temporal horn. So the lateral ventricle has three horns which is the frontal, the occipital, and the temporal hole. Okay. Again, uh, depending on the location of the central sulcus, you will be able to differentiate that this is the frontal lobe. I think here we can see the central sulcus, and here it will be the parietal lobe, and uh, the occipital lobe will be posteriorly. A little bit higher, we can see that there is this is the frontal lobe and uh, then the parietal lobe and the most posteriorly will be the occipital lobe. Now let's talk a little bit about the normal calcifications of the brain uh, CT scan. Normal calcifications that we can see in the brain CT scan. First of all, part of the normal aging process, usually in older age group you can see calcifications in the basal ganglia everything white is either bone or calcification or could be in certain situations a metallic implants if the patient is post-surgical there might be some metals in the brain uh, or can be foreign bodies like for example bullets uh, so everything white is either bone or calcification so this is the bone the skull vault and you can see this whitish thing here they are calcifications and where is the anatomical location of that this is in the basal ganglia the, normally it is in the basal ganglia of course in this case it is prominent in size a little bit we might normally we see it uh, less than that smaller than that but anyway this indicates a normal aging process it is not a pathology in this condition especially if you look carefully you can see there are some brain atrophic changes you can see the sulci are dilated and uh, it is not as uh, compressed as we uh, normally see and they are of course uh, these calcifications are idiopathic in nature but it is part of the aging process we rarely see them in younger age group now, what about these? We said it several times now. These are calcified choroid plexus within the lateral ventricle. The lateral ventricle contains choroid plexus and most of the times they undergo calcification, usually after the age of maybe 18 or 20, something like that, 20 years. So if you see it calcified, it's okay. If you would see it not calcified, it's also okay, depending on the age group. Now, what is this tiny point of calcification? This here is what we call pineal. the pineal gland. The pineal gland is located yeah. here. Just posterior, this is the third ventricle. The, third, the normal third ventricle is slit-like slit and it is located between the right and left uh, thalami. Between the right thalamus and the left thalamus, is, there is only a small tiny gland normally uh, called pineal gland also it uh, with aging it undergoes calcification so this is just a calcified pineal gland okay now we might see calcifications in the ventricle and the two most important calcifica calcifications that most common and we see them a lot of the times <coughs> it's uh, uh, choroid plexus calcification and pineal body calcification so how can we differentiate whether this is a calcification or hemorrhage 
because hemorrhage as we said in the last session also appears as white the blood clots are <coughs> the blood clots are denser than the brain tissue so they also appear as uh, whitish in color we just put the pointer of the CT scan over the white part and we see them the house field unit the computer will display to us a house field unit that indicates the exact density of this whitish structure so if you put it over bone you might have like 700 or 800 or 900 house field units because it's dense also in the calcifications uh, usually it is high density like over six seven hundred house field units while hemorrhage is less hyper dense so it will show densities that might be like one to two hundred house field units uh, sim something like that and also the calcification of the choroid plexus most of the times it's bilateral and symmetrical we rarely see uh, a unilateral calcified choroid uh, plexus uh, so if you see a unilateral increased density this indicates most likely a pathology like hemorrhage especially if it is within the brain parenchyma okay so now let's look at that this is a very common appearance of the brain CT of adult patients you can see this is a calcified choroid plexus both left and right and also you can see the this one in the midline that is just posterior to the third ventricle which is between the two thalami and this is a calcified pineal gland these are normal calcific uh, calcifications in, in due to most of the times so, uh, uh, aging process um, as uh, we might suspect abnormality or pathology if we saw a calcified pineal gland in a very young age group that is for example less than 10 years old uh, with a calcified pineal gland this is abnormal and this indicates some sort of uh, pathology or some it needs further evaluation if it is in a child okay it's like less than 10 years old now let's talk about the blood supply of the brain the blood supply of the brain is of extremely important value because many of the diseases and the pathological conditions that might uh, involve the brain are dependent on the blood supply from which artery uh, is abnormal so we need to know the territory or the parts of the brain that is supplied by each artery okay so first of all we have three main arteries that supply each hemisphere of the brain so both hemisphere of the cerebrum so each cerebrum has three arteries three major arteries okay so both cerebral hemispheres are supplied by six major arteries and the, the territories of these arteries are color coded here you can see here is the anterior cerebral artery the anterior cerebral artery and this red part is the middle cerebral artery and the yellowish part is the posterior cerebral artery so we have the anterior middle and posterior cerebral artery and you can see them here so the anterior cerebral artery supplies the parasagittal part of the cerebral hemisphere this is the median the sagittal uh, line or aspect of the brain and the part just beside it, the parasagittal aspect of the cerebral hemisphere is supplied by the anterior cerebral artery extending from the frontal to the parietal to the posterior part of the cerebrum so all of the parasagittal part especially the frontal and parietal lobes are supplied by the anterior cerebral artery now what about the middle cerebral artery the middle cerebral artery has the most uh, or the biggest territory of the brain it supplies most of the frontal lobe of the temporal lobe and of the parietal lobe most of the cerebral hemisphere is supplied by the middle cerebral artery regarding the posterior cerebral artery it supplies 
the posterior aspect of the cerebral hemisphere, especially the occipital lobe and maybe the adjacent parts of the temporal and parietal lobes. But the main is the occipital lobe and part of the temporal lobe posteriorly. So these three arteries and their territories, every radiologist needs to know their exact territory because it will affect uh, our uh, reporting uh, abilities. So let's go a little bit down. If we go further in, uh, inferiorly, we see a uh, more inferior cuts. You can see this is the parasagittal aspect of the brain, which is, as we said, supplied by the anterior cerebral artery yes, and uh, parts of the parietal and temporal lobes that's supplied by the middle cerebral artery. Middle and you can see the posterior cerebral artery supplying okay. the occipital lobe and the adjacent, the uh, uh, posterior part of the temporal lobe and the uh, parietal lobe. And you can see it also supplies the adjacent, the, the both thalami and the MCA, the middle cerebral artery, is also supplies the uh, basal ganglia, the head of the caudate nucleus and the lentiform nucleus, including the uh, internal capsule, via small branches. There are they are called perforators. So the middle cerebral artery, as it arises from the internal carotid artery, will give multiple small branches called perforators supplying the basal ganglia and then the main trunk of the middle cerebral artery will supply the cerebral hemisphere more inferior cuts we will see the middle cerebral artery supplying the temporal lobe and the anterior cerebral artery supplying the parasagittal aspect also uh, the middle cerebral is supplying the remaining part of the frontal lobe the temporal lobe and you can see this small part of the posterior cerebral artery which as we said supplies the posterior aspect of the temporal lobe the posterior cerebral artery will supply the posterior aspect of the temporal lobe while the brain stem and the cerebellum are supplied by what's called the vertebrobasilar artery or vertebrobasilar system or vertebrobasilar circulation or posterior circulation all of them are uh, synonyms okay so before we talk into stroke I just want to uh, go back and to this cut and let's explain a little bit about where these arteries are originating from first of all the brain is, su oh, is supplied by arteries that arise from the aortic arch okay so we know there are two common carotid arteries and each common carotid artery, the right common carotid and the left common carotid, will divide into internal and external carotid arteries. And the internal carotid artery has no branches extracranially. Outside the, uh, the cranial cavity, the internal carotid artery has zero branches. Okay? So, the internal carotid artery will go through the foramen lacerum and enter into the brain, enter into the cranial cavity, let's say, and uh, it will uh, divide uh, intracranially into the middle cerebral artery and anterior cerebral artery. So, the middle and anterior cerebral arteries are both arising from the internal carotid artery middle cerebral artery and anterior cerebral arteries they are both arising from the internal carotid artery and they both or all of these together they are called the anterior circulation now let's talk a little bit about the posterior circulation where do they come from The vertebrobasilar arteries, it consists of two vertebral arteries. Two vertebral arteries, they arise from the subclavian artery. So the aortic arch will give the subclavian artery on the uh, left side and on the right side will give the brachiocephalic artery. The brachiocephalic artery will divide into common carotid and subclavian artery. So we'll end, we will have right and left subclavian arteries and the 
subclavian arteries will give the vertebral arteries. The vertebral arteries will go through a foramen at the cervical vertebral uh, at the cervical vertebrae. There is a foramen called foramen uh, tra uh, transver uh, uh, vertebral artery foramen. It will go through these foramina and enter into the cranial cavity just here anterior to the medulla oblongata and anterior to the spinal cord and the right vertebral artery and the left vertebral artery will unite will fuse with each other to form this dot that we said in the last uh, session that this is the basilar artery and the basilar artery together with the vertebral arteries will give many branches to supply the brain stem and the cerebral uh, and the cerebellum and then the basilar artery will divide into two branches at the end will the basilar artery terminate into two main branches and these are these two main branches are the post the right and left uh, posterior cerebral arteries which supply the posterior part of the brain so here we should notice few things first of all the internal carotid artery supplies the most of the cerebr uh, cerebrum okay the vast majority of the cerebrum is supplied by the uh, internal carotid artery so if you have or if the patient have uh, CVA, a cerebrovascular accident, he will end up with a stroke uh, in the if, if the stroke or the embolus or the occlusion is in the anterior or middle cerebral artery or in the internal carotid artery, these parts will be affected. So, if the, the frontoparietal part uh, is involved, then there will be this is due to the middle cerebral artery uh, embolism or stroke or occlusion. If the paramedian aspect is involved, this indicates anterior cerebral artery involvement or occlusion. If both are involved, then this indicates internal carotid artery involvement or occlusion. However, the patient is will not die or unlikely to die because these parts, the cerebrum, are responsible for the motor skills and for the cognitive function, the being, uh, uh, the thinking pattern, the personality, and things like that. But the vital centers, the vital centers that are responsible for the heart beating and for breathing and for regulation of blood pressure and temperature and all things like that are here in the brain stem. So the basilar artery or the vertebrobasilar system, although it is smaller in size and less part of the brain is supplied by it, but it is more dangerous or more important or more uh, uh, significant right. if an embolism or occlusion is uh, involving the uh, basilar system. So the midbrain mostly is supplied by the uh, posterior uh, the, the bifurcation of the basilar artery into uh, posterior cerebral arteries and in addition to few smaller branches also arising from the basilar artery like for example the superior cerebellar artery and there uh, and it will send multiple perforators to supply the brain stem so the brain stem and the cerebellum are supplied by the basilar artery which contains all the vital centers so if you have a basilar artery um, uh, occlusion this will most likely be fatal while if you have an internal carotid artery occlusion like on the right side or on the left side it will cause paralysis and uh, slurred speech and maybe unconsciousness but the heart will still be beating, the patient will still be breathing, and uh, the vital uh, functions are still working. Okay? So, let's talk a little bit about stroke. When you see stroke, you need to look for those. What do you mean by those? Those the T means the territory. Which territory is involved? 
the ACA, the MCA, the PCA territory. The H is the hypodensity because when you have a stroke or uh, the patient have a stroke, there will be edema. The edema will cause decreased density of the involved part. So you are looking for the hypodensity. And as we said, due to edema, you will look for the O, the edema. Okay. The S is the swelling and the shift. You see an expansion of the part that is involved. Okay. You'll see expansion of the lobe or the territory that is involved due to the water accumulation, due to the edema. So you are looking for swelling and shift, mass effect, compression of the ventricle, compression or effacement of the sulci. And you look finally for the E, which is the evolution over time. Does it stay the same? Does it decrease in size? Is there any bleeding or things like that? So keep in mind the following. Any patient with suspected stroke, any patient with suspected CVA, cerebral vascular accident, you, the first investigation to be done is a brain CT scan. First thing is a brain CT scan. Why? Because CVA or stroke is of two types. That is either hemorrhagic or uh, ischemic. Okay, either hemorrhagic uh, CVA or ischemic cerebrovascular accident. So, if the ischemic cerebrovascular accident or CVA, the main treatment is thrombolytics. We give the patient thrombolytics to help dissolve the thrombus. If the patient has a hemorrhagic uh, CVA and you give thrombolytic, it will make the bleeding even more and by this you killed him or the one who gave him the thrombolytic will kill the patient so suspected cva patient goes for ct scan if there is hemorrhage then there is no thrombolytic if there is no hemorrhage even if it was normal they can be any uh, the early stages of cva it appears normal or not not no significant findings you see it as a normal uh, ct scan then the diagnosis will be clinically as uh, ischemic cva which is of course mo much more common than hemorrhagic CVA, cva and uh, the, the uh, clinicians will start giving thrombolytics to the patient and after a while the changes will start appearing okay in case there is a hemorrhagic cerebrovascular accident we will see a hematoma either without ventricular extension hematoma that does not extend into the ventricles or hematoma that extends to the ventricular system and in this case if it extends into the lateral or third ventricle uh, we might see a secondary subarachnoid hemorrhage because the ventricles are connected to the subarachnoid space Sometimes we have a primary subarachnoid hemorrhage. There is no intraparenchymal hematoma, no hemorrhagic CVA, just subarachnoid hemorrhage, especially if we have ruptured aneurysm of the arteries. There is an aneurysm of the middle cerebral artery, of the anterior cerebral artery, and it ruptured. It will present by subarachnoid hemorrhage without evidence of intraventricular hemorrhage, and later maybe it will extend into the ventricle okay so it's either hemorrhagic or ischemic if it is hemorrhagic it's either with ventricular extension or without ventricular extension or uh, bleeding intracranial bleeding might be a primary subarachnoid hemorrhage no intraventricular involvement or no intraparenchymal involvement so at the ct scan the ischemic stroke the one the stroke that is due to a thrombus that causes blood supply to stop to the brain it will appear as a hypodense that is black in color when you see the hypodensity of course this is not immediately it takes a while like few hours to appear as a hypodense if you look this is if you see this hypodensity you look for those as we said the vascular territory the hypodensity the edema the swelling and the shift and the evolution okay most of the strokes they occur at the gangliothalamic capsular region that's the area of the basal ganglia most of the strokes occur there 
because they are supplied by a lenticular striatal branch of the middle cerebral artery. So you will see that the basal ganglia are involved while the territory of the MCA is normal or not involved because this branch is the one that is involved. Okay. Now let's look here. This is a CT scan of the brain. Uh, just before I go to the second slide, let's review those. The E stands for evolution, that we follow the patient over time, like in uh, today and after two days, after four days, uh, or if any change in the clinical condition occurred, we might repeat the CT scan. Okay, now let's look. For this brain CT scan, you can see, of course, there is some hypodensity here, okay? And this is the anatomy, uh, anatomically, which part of the, of the brain is this? this is, these are the basal ganglia. You can see here the uh, lentiform nucleus and the internal capsule and possibly the adjacent part of the head of caudate nucleus. They are all hypodense, okay? So, in which territory? Let's look for those. The T is for territory. Medium. Which territory? It is at the territory of Medium. the lenticular striatal branch of the MCA, so which is the most common part to be involved in the basal ganglia due to occlusion of the lenticular striatal part of the MCA, not the main middle cerebral artery. The main middle cerebral artery will involve this part here, okay? And now you look for the rest of the dose, which is the hypodensity, and we saw it, edema, now, edema, you can see that this lateral ventricle is compressed compared to this one because there is edema here, okay? Compressing the adjacent lateral ventricle and indicating this is not an old CVA, this is a new CVA or subacute or subacute CVA and uh, you, we need to see it evolution, its evolution over time. This is the uh, another cut at the same uh, patient and another cut and you can see the region of the basal ganglia is involved due to occlusion of the perforators or the lenticular striatal artery of the MCA. Now, which territory is that? Which territory is involved in this? This is, of course, there is a hypodensity here within the brain parenchyma and this hypodensity uh, is uh, causing swelling and effacement and you can see that it's compressing the adjacent quadrigeminal cistern as we said previously it's compressed here and the overlying cerebral sulci are effaced they are compressed flattened if you compare it to for example normal sulci here or here these are not involved but here they are swollen compressed so which territory is that this is the territory of the posterior cerebral artery. As we said, it involves the occipital lobe and the posterior part of the temporal lobe and, po and possibly the adjacent temporal lobe. Now, this part is the, this is the uh, brainstem and the pons. And this part is the cerebellum. Because we said at the level of the brainstem, you see the cerebellum, the left and the right cerebellar hemispheres. And you can see there is a hypodensity here with some effacement of the overlying cell site. So which territory is that? We can say this is just a vertebral basilar territory. Or depending on if you have more anatomical details, you can say it is the territory of the ICA or of the PICA, which is the posterior inferior cerebellar artery or posterior superior cerebellar artery, and so on. So there are other branches from the vertebral basilar system. But if we say that this is a, a vertebral basilar territory, it's okay. It's also uh, accepted. If you have more anatomical uh, details, which I will not go in uh, in this presentation, we can see say that this is the vertebral basilar system territory. Now, let's look here. This is the posterior part of the cerebellum and uh, of the cerebrum, sorry. And there is edema here, and the edema is causing effacement of the cortical sulci. It is like an expansile lesion. There is accumulation of a fluid. It's causing some mass effect. And again, this is at the territory of the posterior cerebral artery. Now, which territory is that? 
we can see there is this hypodensity that is sparing the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia here are not involved, and you can see these are normal sulci, and these are effaced or compressed sulci and flattened, and it extends to the, this is the temporal lobe, and also extending posteriorly to the level of the occipital lobe, and you can see there is some midline shift due to the mass effect, and this is I don't agree with what's written here. This is a posterior cerebral artery uh, territory, and uh, no, sorry, uh, this is the MCA territory. I'm so sorry. This is an inferior branch of the MCA division. The MCA, the middle cerebral artery, comes from the uh, cavernous sinus, and it goes laterally here, and then bifurcates into anterior and posterior divisions, and the posterior division is uh, occluded or involved here causing involvement of this part of the temporal lobe and extending posteriorly but sparing this part which is the occipital lobe okay so the occipital lobe is spared this indicates it's not a posterior cerebral artery uh, involvement okay i'm so sorry for the misunderstanding now this is a full-blown cva it is a very big one uh, com causing compression of the uh, sulci of the cerebral hemisphere and it's causing complete obliteration or complete compression of the lateral ventricle on the right side and is causing some mass effect and shifting of the midline to the left side now which territory is that uh, this is the main uh, the, the main uh, trunk of the middle cerebral artery infarction or involvement okay so this is the territory of the MCA, the main trunk. It extends from the frontal and parietal lobe, and if we go inferiorly, we'll see the temporal lobe, or most of the temporal lobe also involved. Now, what's this? Which territory is that? It's the parasagittal part of the cerebe cerebral hemisphere, and it is just parasagittal on the left side involving frontal lobe, and if we go most more superiorly, we'll see the parietal lobe here also involved. This is a typical distribution of the anterior cerebral artery territory. Typically, this is a very typical anterior cerebral artery territory. Here, here we can also see a very typical distribution of the middle cerebral artery territory. Okay. Again, this is a infarction in the left middle cerebral artery mostly this is the anterior division of the middle cerebral artery involvement here and here you can see it's very similar and here there uh, these are images of the same patient showing the anterior cerebral artery uh, infarction and it is in the acute or subacute stage because you can see flattening of the overlying cerebral sulci this is very important in cases uh, that, especially if you are working in a center that have um, interventional radiology uh, unit, because they, the radiology or the interventional neuroradiologist need to know which artery is involved so that he can go into the right into that artery and remove the thrombus. So being familiar with the arterial territories are very important in this regard. Okay. Uh, I think we will stop here now at uh, this slide and we will continue later after two days, inshallah. Okay, I uh, hope you are all benefited from that and uh, thank you very much.